So we're going to look at the important transition from the Delian League into the Athenian Empire, which is a really important topic in regard the period in regard to the period of 479 to 446, where we see Greece starting to descend into conflict. We're going to look at the Delian League turning into the Athenian Empire, the so-called First Peloponnesian War, and then those increasing tensions between Sparta and Athens. Now, importantly, we get our information from the Athenian writer Thucydides. And you need to have a reasonable understanding about his background, his exile, his historical method. And certainly Thucydides does tell us an awful lot about how he aims at accuracy, how he attempts to interpret the evidence that he's got, and also about how he's going to write his history. And there are certain sections in Thucydides that could be used in the majority of essay questions, but of course not in a generic way. Remember, crucially, whenever you're using any information from the sources, you do have to tie that information very tightly to the events and the way in which you're using your sources. Source analysis is absolutely pivotal. So in regard to Thucydides, there's a few sections dotted throughout his work that really help us in regard to the way that he's writing and just general discussion of historiography. So basically, Thucydides certainly says that he is trying to bring all the evidence forward uh, and he absolutely thinks that once we've seen the evidence, we'll accept the conclusions that he has reached as well. Um, in regard to speeches and um, events, Thucydides knows that he can't record speeches word for word. So he always tries to present us with information or the speech as he thought it should have been delivered. And he's either got it from eyewitnesses or from um, you know, general impressions about how the speech would have been delivered. Some speeches Thucydides actually would have been there for, certainly in Athens before his exile, but there are others they will have spoken to other people and then will simply be portraying the speech in the manner that he think it would have, he would have been delivered. But crucially, when he uses an eyewitness report, he does say that he checks with it very, very, very thoroughly. In regard to Athens and the way that its democracy deteriorates. Book two, verse 65 is really, really useful in sort of summarizing Thucydides' view about the entire period of the Peloponnesian War, I feel. The idea that Pericles had left Athens wisely, but then crucially after his death, the Athenians do the opposite to his advice and then end up being tied up in disastrous military expeditions such as the Sicilian expedition. And then in regard to his coverage on Sparta, obviously we don't have any Spartan written sources, but crucially because Thucydides was exiled from Athens, he said that it gave him the liberty of wandering around the Peloponnese and getting a, a rough view from both sides. He calls it exceptional facilities for looking into things. So there's some really useful material in Thucydides um, about some generic issues, about about how he's a reliable historian, how he uses speeches, how he views Athenian politics, and for his coverage of Sparta and the Peloponnese. So let's begin with Thucydides anyway, and his view of the 50 years, the rough 50 years between the end of the Persian Wars and the start of the Peloponnesian War. Uh, he uses the term Pentacontetia, and it summarizes by the rough 50 year gap between the Persian Wars and the Peloponnesian War, where Thucydides feels the Athenians got stronger and the Spartans more and more fearful. So if we're going to look at the transition of the Delian League into the Athenian Empire and those increasing tensions with Sparta, then we've really got to look at the situation immediately following the Persian invasion. And we can start off with the refortification of Athens. Athens had been completely destroyed during the Persian occupation and had actually been occupied on two occasions. And Themistocles, the hero of Salamis, certainly set about refortifying Athens. Now, eventually, the um, long walls will link the port of Piraeus to the Athenians. That will take time to do that. But the whole idea of the long walls is that um, it would really make any Spartan siege pretty sort of impotent. 
but this will take some time. But in the meantime, Themistocles is focused on refortifying the city itself. And we're told that this is done in a really hurried and rushed way. In regard to the long walls, the idea was to link the city of Athens to the port of the of the Piraeus. And you can see a sort of older image from the Piraeus looking up to the Acropolis there. This is what, in all, you know, in actual fact, they would have roughly looked like by the start of the Peloponnesian War. Now, the reason why this refortification of Athens is important is because it's an early indication of Spartan Athenian tensions, literally just after they pushed the Persians out of Greece. The Spartans very famously didn't have any wars. Their, the, their wars were the spear tips of its soldiers. But Thucydides in Book 1, verse 89 to 93, does give us some indication about why the Spartans were so resistant to Athens rebuilding its fortifications. And the idea was that these refortifications and, and, and these rebuilding of Athens' walls really sh demonstrated Athens' growth in power. The Spartans didn't want Athens building its base because officially they didn't want the Persians coming back and potentially using it as a base to operate from, as they had done with Thebes. But unofficially and on the sly, it's really in Sparta's interest to keep Athens a week in Greece. Um, the walls themselves would mean that Athens would be less likely to engage in a pitch battle, easily defended by a smaller number of soldiers. And fortifications like this are uh, certainly a status symbol. And the role of Themistocles in producing these walls is he essentially stalls the Spartans until the walls are produced. So this whole um, issue of the refortification of Athens is an early indication of tensions between Athens and Sparta. That's further increased through the actions of Pausanias in Ionia, in the, um, uh, on the coastline of modern day Turkey. After the defeat of the Persian invasion, the allied Greeks decided to continue with attacks on Persia and the lead of the allied Greeks was the Spartan regent Pausanias. Now we're told that Pausanias pretty much alienates the Ionian Greeks from him and Sparta and the Ionian Greeks look to Athenian leadership. So in short, Pausanias is seen as a bit of a loser and Aristides, the Athenian general, who we first met during the Persian Wars in our course, uh, is pretty cool. We've got three sources that pretty much corroborate on this. So we've got Diodorus, who's writing in the first century BC, and Plutarch that agree with Thucydides. And when we've got three sources in agreement, that's pretty pretty uh, reliable stuff. Thucydides says that Pausanias was unpopular with the Greeks, that he seemed to be collaborating with the Persians, and he's brought back to Sparta to stand trial. And after that, Sparta sends out no other commanders. Diodorus pretty much makes the same point. He says that this time it's mainly Aristides being the main driver because of his, his fair behaviour towards them, towards the allies. He's the one that persuades it's the uh, the uh, the soon to be dealing lead to base itself on Delos. He's the one that talks about everyone contributing to this mutual defense league. Uh, and it's the Spartans aren't really sort of happy about uh, this uh, at all. They even, interestingly, debate going to war. So even this soon after the Persian Wars, these simmering tensions between Sparta and Athens are evident. Plutarch um, sort of pretty much corroborates both by saying that Aristides is kind and fair, Pausanias is the opposite, and that's why the Allies transfer their loyalty to Sparta and Sparta stops sending out commanders. So we've got three sort of sources that agree with each other, that uh, the Athenians are viewed as, 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 as the goodies and the Spartans aren't interested and retreat uh, and sort of go to sleep for the next few years and let the Athenians get more and more powerful. And they certainly do that through the formation of the Delian League. And Thucydides gives us some great um, discussion about how the Delian League is created with the object to ravage the territory of the King of Persia to gain compensation for all of the ills that the Greeks had suffered during the Persian invasions. Thucydides tells us that the original arrangements are as such. So Athens is the hegemon, the leader of the league. It's all based on the neutral island of Delos, the birthplace of Apollo. It's the Athenians that assess contributions. So the small states uh, will supply money. The larger states will supply their ships or their men. It's the Athenians that are the ones that decide who exactly 
uh, provides what the original sum of 460 talents is substantial that's the original money that's coming into the league it's voluntary to join the allies are independent um, and there's even, even an oath about metal bars floating um, or the Persians being destroyed as to how long the league uh, will work for uh, so Thucydides gives us a really interesting starting point of the Delian League and pretty much from this point onwards, our Greek world is on the whole divided between two camps, between the Delian League and Sparta's Peloponnesian League. It's really worth noting that right from the start, though, Thucydides does show that Athens has an inherent advantage in terms of its leadership of the Delian League. And this is none more so than in the discussion of tribute, which Thucydides gives us in Book 1, verse 96. And obviously, Thucydides has got a really good understanding of how Athens has accumulated its wealth and power by the time that he's writing. To start off with, only the smaller states provide tribute. But over time, more and more states opted to pay Athens instead of actually fighting. And what we've got is a situation where these allies provide this tribute to Athens and Athens is using that tribute to build more and more triremes. And Thucydides says that this is why the allies themselves were to blame for Athens getting so powerful, because if one of these allies were to revolt, then Athens could use all of its resources and the other allies to bully this state back into the alliance. So it's really, really, really important that we can see that right from the start, the Athenians have an advantage. However, it does take time. It's not swift imperialism, this. Um, the Athenian domination and control over the Delian League is, you know, gradual over decades. So let's look at the early actions of the Delian League. The Delian League, according to Thucydides and Plutarch, is certainly under the leadership of Cimon, the son of Miltiades, the victor uh, at Marathon. And Cimon has got, like many aristocratic Athenians, a very positive view of Sparta and certainly doesn't want to provoke an Athenian-Spartan war. We're told that he views Athens and Sparta as yoke partners, the idea that Athens and Sparta would work together for the benefit of the Greeks. So in terms of those actions, it is an, a, a very gradual expansion of Athenian influence. It's not rapid. The first so-called action of the Delian League could be viewed to be Eon in 476 BC in the north of Greece, where a Persian garrison is pushed out. And that certainly fits in line, uh, or, or is in line rather, with the per, with the objective of the Delian League to ravage the territory of the king. But interestingly, in 474 BC, the League chooses to attack the island of Skyros, which is in the middle of the Aegean, which is controlled by um, pirates, the Dolopians. And this is maybe an indication that the Delian League is now not going to target just Persian bases and Persian operations. Certainly no one would have really disputed attacking a bunch of pirates, but it, this does maybe indicate that there is already a start of a shift um, between just exclusively attacking Persian dominions. The third action of the Delian League in 472, and notice the two-year gaps between each of these, is an attack on the Medizing city-state of Charistus on Euboea. Charistus is forced into the Delian League, so that's important because this voluntary organisation is now making people join it. But again, this is not rapid. This is over a period of six years, so it's not a rapid expansion. In 470, Thucydides tells us that the island of Naxos is the first to break the constitution of the League and doesn't pay its tribute before the Persians have been defeated, and Naxos is forced back into the alliance and its ships confiscated. So this is an important shift that this is the first time an ally is attacked and forced back into the League. We've also got in 468 the Battle of Euromidon in southern Turkey. Really, the detail comes from Plutarch on, uh, on that in 468 BC, where the Persian fleet is, is caught and destroyed by Cimon um, uh, uh, just off the coast of southern Turkey. Now, we're told that this really does damage Persia's ab ability to conquer or to invade uh, Greece. So really, technically speaking, should our dealing league cease, should cease to, ex uh, to exist at this point? And it's probably you know, not unlikely that this was one of the key triggers for the revolt of Thassos in 465 BC. Um, Thassos is going to be a really, really, really important revolt because it will ask for Sparta for aid. Sparta will agree, but 
crucially this is after Euromidium where so you know you could argue that there's now no longer a need for a Delian League. In regard to this gradual expansion of Athenian influence Aristotle later on gives us a, a really great quote to show how the Athenians and the domination was viewed uh, later on in, in the, the next century. Aristotle remarking that those in positions of power do the same with regard to cities and nations, as for example, the Athenians with regard to Samos, Chios and Lesbos. For as soon as they had a firm hold over their empire, they humbled these alliances contrary to agreements. So basically, these islands were rather contrary to agreements. The idea that Athens was harsh and broke the arrangements of the Delian League. So the revolt of Thassos in 465 is really important because, first of all, it's a dispute with Athens over mines and actually nothing to do with the Persians. It's after Euromidon and importantly, they ask Sparta for uh, aid. Sparta, we're told, agreed to this. So again, even in 465, the Spartans are agreeing to invade Attica to relieve uh, 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 an Athenian target. The Spartans are prevented from doing that because of an earthquake which triggers a helot revolt and so Sparta was unable to help Phasos by invading Attica. Cimon, unknowing that Sparta, unknown rather that Sparta had agreed to help Phasos, sent Athenian hoplites to help Sparta and very importantly those Athenian hoplites were sent home because Sparta didn't want the virus of democracy spreading amongst the helots and the Peloponnese. Meanwhile the Athenians subdued Thassos, destroyed its walls, confiscated its fleet. So this Thassos revolt is important and particularly the earthquake, the, the idea that the Spartans agreed to help and then those Athenian hoplites are sent home because it does revolt in the exile of Cimon, the son of Miltiades. He's kicked out of Athens and certainly replaced by Pericles, who's got a completely different attitude to the war against the Persians, to Sparta, and to the Athenian allies. You could certainly say that Pericles is maybe uninterested in continuing the war with Persia. He's much more anti-Spartan than Cimon was. Um, and in terms of the Athenian allies, could you argue that Pericles viewed the allies as merely cash cows? It's no surprise that the first Peloponnesian war is accelerated or, or certainly is, is, is is, is created rather from this uh, from this situation. So what do we mean by the first Peloponnesian War, not the main Peloponnesian War? The first Peloponnesian War, you could include some of these key topics. You could disagree with me, include other ones. But on the whole, the Egyptian campaign and what Athens does in relation to the Egyptian campaign's failure, um, the constant side switching of Megara, um, uh, the Athenian attack on Ahena, the Battle of Tanagra, and the dispute at Delphi, um, known as the Sacred War. So what's been going on? Whilst Athens has been increasing this um, its control over the Delian League, in 460 BC, um, Delian League forces began operating in Egypt to aid the Egyptians in a rebellion against the Persians. However, it's crucial to be aware that this is not going to go well. This campaign will last for six years and end in failure. However, while that's starting in 460, there are disruptions and different things going on in Greece itself, uh, in particular between Megara and Ahena. Uh, two allies of Sparta, Megara and Corinth, entered into a border war, and when faced with defeat, Megara left the, Sp the Peloponnesian League and joined Athens' empire or Athens' is dealing league, soon to be the Athenian Empire. Now, this is advantageous to Athens because it would mean that they would be able to bottle up the Spartan army in the Peloponnese. But the Corinthians really hated the Athenians because of this. Thucydides says it was because of this that the Corinthians bitterly hated Athens. In 458, the Athenians attacked um, Ahena, unprovoked attack on the eyesore of the Piraeus, as Pericles would say, uh, and forced, forced Ahena into the Dealing League, soon to be Athenian Empire. Um, the Ahenetans had always been sympathizers of the Peloponnesian League because of their old rivalry with the Athenians. Meanwhile, in 457, the Spartan force returning from Dorsus um, uh, and from assisting their allies was attacked by the Athenians at Tanagra. So we've got this massive increase in tension between Sparta and Athens, or certainly between Athens and the Peloponnesian powers. Meanwhile, in 454 BC, we've got a, a massive 
collapse in Athenian fortunes in Egypt. So the Athenians are battered in their Egyptian campaign by uh, the Persians. There's a really interesting um, inscription um, in terms of a war memorial which corroborate, corroborates Thucydides' discussion about um, about the Egyptian campaign and it might be worth pausing this at some point just to uh, just to read this now about how this war memorial how this inscription corroborates Thucydides' discussion um, of the disaster in Egypt for the dealing league and for the Athenians. For our module, it's absolutely crucial to be aware that in 454 BC, Pericles used the excuse of the Egyptian disaster to move the treasury of the Dealing League from Delos to Athens. And at this point, you can pretty much sort of start referring to the Dealing League as an Athenian empire. Crucially, though, was that attack on Ahina and the support for Egypt in line with the arrangements for the Dealing League? You could certainly um, agree or disagree um, with that. So we've got a hob on. So we've got a pan on the hob and that water is starting to bubble up uh, and that continues to bubble up the tension between the Athenians uh, and the Peloponnesians. So eventually a truce was agreed between the Athenians and the Peloponnesians. Thucydides tells us that in 110 to 113 of Book 1. Meanwhile, Kimon, who's been recalled from exile, ends up continuing to attack Persians and ends up being killed in Cyprus. And then we've got this issue of dispute over Delphi between the Delphians and the Phocians. Now, Sparta restored Delphi to the Delphians it had been occupied the, by the Phocians. Uh, and when Sparta left, the Athenians marched in and gave Delphi back to the Phocians again. So if you're looking at a local example, I suppose uh, a good example would be the Blackpool Tower. It's imagine Delphi is the sanctuary at Delphi rather, is the Blackpool Tower. It's a bit like Blackpool and Lancashire having a dispute over who controls the Blackpool Tower. Um, that's how you need to maybe liken in your head the Phocian and the Delphian dispute over the control of the sanctuary at Delphi. Uh, the Athenians marched against Coronea and captured uh, the town and enslaved the inhabitants and left a garrison. So again, that's going to really sort of seethe off the Boeotians. Uh, and meanwhile, an Athenian army was defeated on the way home. Um, and, and basically, again, we've got this increasing tension between our Athenians, our Boeotians and our Peloponnesians. So let's put this all in a rough chronology. In 451 BC, we've got a five-year peace made with the Peloponnesians. In 451, dealing league forces under Kimon take Cyprus, but of course Kimon is killed. Um, Diodorus claims that this success forced the Persians to propose a peace treaty, and it's called the Peace of Callias. So we can put that in for another one of our key learning points, the Peace of Callias. The Peace of Callias is really quite interesting because there is a debate over whether there actually was ever a Peace of Callias. Diodorus and Plutarch maintain that the peace terms are really advantageous to the Athenians and the Greeks and not to the Persians. Um, so in essence, all Greek city-states were to live under their own laws. The Persians were not to come within three days march of the sea. And if the terms were observed, the Athenians would not invade Persian territory. So that's what Diodorus and Plutarch say. Interestingly, though, that there's no specific Thucydides reference to this. Now, one of the exam spec sources is Harpocration, who is writing much later on. And Harpocration basically says that this is potentially a fake treaty that's been written up by later Athenians to show how powerful they are. However, to contrast that, there is certainly an implication in Thucydides of an existence of this treaty when he's talking about later attempts when Athens tries to ally with Persia. So the piece of Callias is a bit tricky, but it gives you a real opportunity to use multiple sources here and to discuss the debate about whether the piece of Callias actually existed. But again, in summary, the key things is, the key th key learning is, Diodorus and Plutarch state that these are the terms of the piece of Callias. Harpocration, writing much later in the second century AD, he says that it's actually a fake peace treaty, that it's not actually a peace treaty because it's written in a different alphabet. We've got simmering tensions with the Peloponnese. 
So yet again, Euboea and Megara cause problems for the Athenians. Megara revolts this time from Athens, uh, and that provokes a Spartan invasion of Attica. Um, the Spartans, though, end up returning home because supposedly Pericles resorted to bribery uh, to bribe the Spartan king um, to leave. And a 30-year truce made between the Athenians and Spartans was completed in 445 BC. And it's that truce that is debated at the later debate at Sparta and Allied Congress that the Athenians had broken. One final thing in this period, which is going to set the tone for the actual build up to the Peloponnesian War, is the revolt of Samos that's given to us by Thucydides. Now, we get a much greater detail from this from a Corinthian delegate much later on in the build up to the causes of the war between Athens and Sparta. But interestingly, Samos um, is. Um, is really important because it's a powerful Delian League ally or now Athenian Empire ally uh, that revolted and Pericles led the Athenians. They absolutely defeated the Samian navy, um, walls destroyed, fleet confiscated, typical Athenian treatment. But this event will be important because years later, we hear from a Corinthian delegate that the Spartans had actually agreed to go to war with the Athenians at this point in the Corsaira debate. So what we can see is from the start of this period, the Delian League that supposedly is quite positive turns into an Athenian empire, but this is not a rapid change. It does take place over decades, but certainly by the end of the period in the 440s, we can absolutely see that the Greek world is ready for an explosive conflict between Athens and her allies and Sparta and her Peloponnesian allies.